Good morning, and welcome to the first invited papers session, invited talks section. I'm Bob Patty. I'm the president of Enhanced Semiconductors. We do pioneering two and a half and 3D integrations and have been delivering those solutions since 1999. Our first speaker is Bill Herod, and he has a very long and distinguished uh, background here. I'll read some of uh, my notes on it. Dr. Herod is the program manager at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, IARPA. He focuses on areas of scientific research, including uh, strategic computing, trusted microelectronics, nanoscale image re uh, reconstruction, uh, and, and data analytic, uh, analytics algorithms. He manages IARPA's Agile program, which he's gonna discuss this morning. Um, he aims to revolutionize through the Agile program uh, computer architectures for our country's strategic uh, essential data challenges. He also manages the Super Cables program, which develops egress solutions for cryogenic computers and other electronics to help meet the intelligence community's needs for energy efficient compute. In addition, Dr. Herod manages the Raven program, which developed prototype analysis tools for creating X-ray images from X, from X-ray uh, tomographic scans of integrated circuits. Prior to joining IARPA, Dr. Herod served as director of uh, the Advanced Research Division of the Department of Energy Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office. He managed uh, programs at DARPA, including groundbreaking uh, exascale studies that involved leading experts in the industry and academia investigating architectures, software systems, resiliency applications, and a variety of other things uh, to meet the challenges of today's exascale platforms in the ubiquitous high-performance computing program, UHPC. The UHPC program planted the seeds for the 1000X increase in computer performance that ultimately led from petascale to the exascale platform that we now have today. The title of his talk, Agile, the Future of Data Center Computing, um, and I want to present Dr. Herod. So I'd, I'd like to uh, start by apologizing for the long bio. Where I work, uh, you have to submit things to be approved to be released, and it's easier to just have one version than have to resubmit it just because you deleted a line. So <laughs> I apologize. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I um, want to start by thanking the uh, technical committee for inviting me to come give this talk. Um, I'm very excited to, to uh, to talk about the Agile program. Uh, it was actually three years ago uh, at SC, whatever it was, uh, I was here meeting with people from the DOE labs who were gonna be my future partners in terms of test and evaluation. And yes, it took us three years to get to the point where we are today, which only shows you how slow the government can actually be. But we do have a program and we signed six contracts at the end of September, and so we are finally able to, to move forward. So when I conducted the uh, D DARPA exascale studies, um, which have been previously mentioned, um, our goal was to, to uh, determine whether or not we could build a 20 megawatt uh, exascale computer in the 2015-2016 timeframe. Um, it was a very extensive effort. It, it lasted for about 1.5 years. Uh, when, when I got the funding for it, the director of DARPA said, so you'll be done in 16 weeks, won't you? And I said, no, I don't think so. And fortunately, he didn't pull the plug on me uh, uh, over the next uh, 18 months. But there were three conclusions from the exascale studies. Uh, one was that, yes, uh, it looked feasible to be able to talk about building an, an exascale computer. 20 megawatts uh, might have been a stretch. In fact, we had uh, several results that showed that it wouldn't happen. We, we were not focused on, on LINPAC. Um, we were focused on 
science applications that typically from, from you know, DOE and, and, and other places of that type. Um, so that was good news, and so as you probably are quite aware, um, Frontier is an exascale computer, uh, 1.6 exaflops, very impressive, on Linpack, and it's 21 megawatts, so I guess in some sense we're, 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 we're right. Uh, a little bit later than 2015, but that's okay. Uh, it was a tremendous effort that DOE put together to uh, uh, design, build, and, and install those systems. That is, that is not a simple task at all. The second uh, uh, conclusion was that to really get the best out of the system, you need to use um, co-design. And, and in fact, if you sat through Jack's talk, which was a fabulous talk a few minutes ago, you know, he talked about, you know, years ago, people would throw the hardware over the fence and then you have to run around and figure out how to use it. Um, one of the conclusions of the study was that that's just wrong. You really need to take a look at what you're designing the computer for, really get engaged with the applications, and, and make sure that the architecture can satisfy the needs of those applications. Um, and the third thing that was talked about is, is that it's a data movement problem. Now, when we talk about data movement there, we weren't talking about the data movement problem that I'm gonna talk about today. It was really on the energy costs of moving the data. Uh, you can easily take a look at the energy cost for moving a, a word on a die to a floating point ALU, and, and you actually, depending on where you are, it exceeds the energy required to do that operation. So you can imagine if I go off the die, I'm seriously in trouble, and if I have to go to a drive someplace, I'm, I'm, I'm dead in the water. So that wasn't actually the data movement problem that we have here. What we, what we have here are, are uh, the fact that we have incredibly sparse data sets and the operations that are performed on the data set are very few. And so you do a lot of movement of data, but you don't get a lot of operations out of it. And so what you really want to do is efficiently move the data. So what is the Agile program supposed to do? Well, it's really designed to, to determine the future of computing based on the data movement problem, not on floating point units or, or ALUs. Um, there, the intent here is, is that all the performers are, are developing full system designs. One of the conclusions that we went into the program with was that it wasn't good enough to just come in and do a faster memory or a faster CPU or a faster network interface. You really have to take a holistic view at the design of the computer if you really want to get the best results out of it. Um, so I, I, I don't see the future as being reliant on just getting a better accelerator because getting a better accelerator doesn't solve the data movement problem. In fact, most likely the accelerator is going to use some sort of standard interface to the rest of the system that is not designed at all for this problem. So let's, let's take a quick look at this, this data problem. Most of what we look at are, are graphs. Um, a graph is composed of a vertices and, and edges. Um, the graphs of interest to this program are absolutely massive. As you can see in this table in the upper right-hand corner, this was from a study that was um, printed in, I think, 2013, that's what it says. So 10 years ago, and at that time, they were predicting, uh, you know, billion uh, vertices in, 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 a, in a graph. That's absolutely huge. Now, I don't know that, that anybody is going to, uh, on a regular basis, deal with a, a brain, uh, but, but it is a massive number of vertices. So I included in this bottom right-hand corner some, some data that, that I came across uh, at Stanford. So these, these problems, they're, they're huge, but they're not even as huge as the ones I'm focused on. But I wanted to, people to see the amount of storage required for these graphs. And, and it is also huge. So it's gonna exceed your ability to, to store it in local memory, for example. If you can store the, the, the graph in a local memory for a single processor, uh, you can really do pretty good on performance. The problem we have is the data is distributed all across the memory system. It's random in nature, it's incredibly sparse, and, and that's, that's the problem. I can't, you know, if you look at uh, the way we, we deal with sparse linear algebra on systems, 
But what you try to do is, is decompose it into clusters where all the data within that cluster has a higher degree of interaction than outside of the cluster. And, and in this particular case here, we don't have that as an option because the data is all over the place. And in fact, the data is changing. So you can't pre-position the data to meet your computational needs. So to, to, to drive the co-design process, we selected four applications. Um, the first, first two are based on, on knowledge graphs. Um, the first particular uh, application, you're, you're doing vertex classification and uh, link prediction and multi-hop reasoning to predict uh, new, new paths. And the second one is focused on pattern matching. You're given a pattern graph and you want to see whether or not it, it, it matches some element within the graph exactly or partially or, or whatever. Um, and and the, the algorithms that are involved are, are all over the spectrum, including a graph neural network. The, the third application uh, is intended to look at sequences of data in terms of identifying and clustering the data. For, for the application, uh, the team that's developing this is, is, um, is um, using a, 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 the meta Hipner 2 application code. This, this is a very significant application developed at the, the Joint Genome Institute at, at Berkeley. They put a lot of effort into optimizing this code, and it's 40,000 lines long, which if you think about the code design process, I just lost you because there's no way to deal with a code that's 40,000 lines long. Um, so they're gonna come up with a much smaller version, otherwise it's, it's not realistic. But the characteristics would be very similar to what you have in that particular code. And the fourth one is, is, is forming networks of networks. Uh, this was a very intriguing uh, idea that has been put forward. And of course there the challenge is, is, to, is to construct a single graph based on these, 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 these graphs that you have uh, and then you want to do things like, like identify the influential nodes and, and other characteristics. So all four of these applications are being developed by uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. John Fayo is in charge of this effort. I think the first two are complete or nearly complete and have been released to the teams. Uh, I don't actually have an update on the uh, Meta Hipner 2. Uh, and the networks of networks, but they're all supposed to be finished by the, by the end of this uh, calendar year. So if you take a look at these applications, um, there's, there's obviously some commonality between them. Uh, the first and probably the most important is, is, that, is that the people who use these applications need the results in near real time or within hours. And today when you're trying to use those type of applications, it takes hours and hours to get the result and, or, or, or worse. And so the idea, of course, is we wanna be in a predictive environment rather than a forensic environment. Predictive is I wanna see what might happen. To see what might happen, I need to see the data as it is changing and not wait for a long time. And, and I, to be honest, I, I, uh, I stole that concept from David Bader, who's in the audience right here. He used to use his slide for the longest time. All right, so, so, so what's, what's wrong? I mean, I mean we, if you, you listen to Jack's talk, you, you realize what a, what, a, what a wonderful state of the art is. You know, we can do uh, X-scale computing. Uh, there are talks here about doing graph analytics on Frontier, so obviously it works. Uh, the problem is it's not designed for graph analytics. It's designed for basically physics-based simulations uh, which of course involves sparse computations. I'm not saying they're all dense linear algebra, but, but it's really not what they're designed for. <clears throat> and you had this, this over-provisioning of resources. Jack, in his talk, <clears throat> mentioned the over-provisioning of floating point. You know, you, it's really easy to stick a GPU in there with a really dense floating point count and, and you, you can get your theoretical peak up. Getting the peak is a different story. Um, there's, there's also deep hierarchical memories uh, you know, when you have a situation where, where you, you load a, a word or two in, do some processing on it, and just throw it out, you have really poor 
uh, computational data locality. Uh, with, a, with a cache based system, the idea is you bring the data into the cache and use it as many times as you can, and then you, then you move on. Well, <clears throat> we don't have that in the data analytics area at all. The other problem is, is the network itself. Um, yes, there's significant improvement in terms of bandwidth on these networks. It's, it's really quite impressive to tell you the truth. But the latency for moving small packets around is not where we need it. So the bandwidth is great, and that's wonderful, but if I'm just gonna move you know, uh, 16 words or four words around, I, I, I don't get the performance out of that network that you would expect given its bandwidth. And therein lies the problem. And you can't always aggregate all the data together to build big packets out of it, because if I'm randomly accessing data all over the place, it's really hard to say, well, solve it through aggregation, which is the, a good approach, but, but it's not, not very helpful in these problems. And the last, of course, is, is that <clears throat> it's all based on traditional bulk synchronous execution models, which is MPI. And, and it works extremely well. And, and productivity in using MPI is fantastic. If you, if you really looked into the libraries and functions that are available, it, it is great. But it's designed for a different problem set. The, the overhead involved in an MPI call is fairly high relative to the small data packets. For a large package of data, you amortize it over a large number of words and you can say it's not a big deal. So those are, those are four fundamental problems that, that we have to overcome. And that is the intent of the, of the Agile program. Um, I think I skipped this on a previous slide. I, I'd like to mention that, that in IARPA, there's, there's a very, um, uh, focused effort for every program w where every program has an independent test and evaluation team. All the results are verified by an independent team. These are typically uh, FFRDCs, DOE labs, or, or whatever you want. And so in the case of my program, there are three areas that, that we, we dip into. I already mentioned John Feo at Pacific Northwest Lab doing the applications. John is a leading expert in graph analytics, so he's definitely the right, the right person. He's got a very strong team behind him. Uh, the, the second area is uh, SST at Sandia National Lab. Uh, what we're gonna do here is we're going to develop models of these designs. They can, they can use whatever software they want, but I have to be able to verify those models using SST or fire sim, because I need an independent assessment of their results, uh, and that effort is led by uh, Joe Kenny at Sandia National Laboratory. And the third is, is uh, Berkeley National Lab, John Schauf, and his responsibility is uh, with fire sim, but it's also the verification and validation of the designs. Okay, so, so in the BAA, which I'm sure you've all read before this talk, um, there, there are some suggested technical approaches. Um, I think, I think uh, there's a few of them that are, are probably absolutely critical. Uh, by the way, they were, none of the performers were required to do all these technical approaches, but they would also have to justify why they chose not to do these technical approaches. I think the, 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 one of the big ones is this first one here, tightly integrated design. You know, it, it, it doesn't do a lot of good if I go out and make a super fast graph accelerator, yet I haven't solved the data movement problem because then I, I'm just waiting for data to arrive. It doesn't do any good to have a, a future fast physical network if the network interface doesn't deal with it properly. So you really need to have this holistic view. You need to look at how I can break down these barriers. We've seen this already today, you know, uh, uh, CPUs with HBM, uh, memory modules on, on a substrate is a step towards integrating those two together. Um, I don't think it really solves all the problems that we have here, but it's a step in the right direction. The, the other one is, is this whole issue of, of, of intelligent mechanisms for moving the data around. You, you really need to, to, the problems are data driven, so, so you need to have a mechanism for, for bringing the data where you need it or not bring the data where you need it. And it's not just a question of a floating point unit sitting there doing load stores, load stores. That is not an intelligent mechanism for moving the data around. 
And the last, and probably in my view, maybe even the most important, is, is the runtime system. The assumption here is, is that these systems are just, they're just doing something all the time. And, and you really need to have something that's looking to see what is happening. And you don't want it to have to be the programmer who takes total control over this, because then, then we're all in serious trouble. Um, and so the runtime system uh, not only is what's controlling what's happening on the computer, but it needs to have interaction with the hardware itself and not just a body of software that sits on top of it. Okay, so we released a, a, a BAA in, in uh, late November of 21. Uh, proposals were due about two months later uh, at the uh, end of January. And as I said, um, and now we have uh, six signed contracts. And yes, it took me all summer to negotiate the, the, uh, the, the contracts. Um, it was a long, extensive process. I don't know why it took so long, but it seemed to take a long time. Uh, the, as I said on our, right there, the, the uh, Army Research Office is the one who released the BAA, and, and uh, they were incredibly supportive in terms of the contracting, of course. So we funded six institutions, AMD, Georgia Tech, Indiana, Intel, Qualcomm, University of Chicago. Uh, we received a large number of proposals. I, I can't really tell you what that number is. And I, but I can tell you there were some really outstanding proposals submitted. It wasn't like we only had six, we had a lot more. But, but in the government, as in most places, you live by your budget. And so this is where we had to cut it off at six. So I'm going to talk about some of their, their, their technical approaches. These are part of their effort. This is not their effort. Uh, and keep in mind that the, that the projects really started October 1. And, and most of the groups were not working until they got a signed contract, which is the right thing to do, of course. Uh, so some of this is, is, is ideas that, that they put in their proposal. Um, when I wrote the BAA, uh, we said quite explicitly that there was going to be an open discussion of the ideas that were being funded. Doesn't mean the design is 100% open. You know, uh, Intel is not going to give away their design for obvious reasons. But there needs to be an open discussion because we're transitioning from a world of dense computations, which is what Jack was really talking about earlier, into a world of sparse computations. And, and it's, a, it's a big transition, and companies aren't going to move forward with changing designs until we can verify and validate these ideas. And the best way to do that is to get the discussion out in the community and not just keep it in a locked room. Uh, as you can imagine, some of them are slightly resistant to this openness issue. But we'll get them there. So the first three are all related. To, to the movement to data. The first one is move the compute to the data. The second is compute everywhere. And the third is access data everywhere. All three of those have a different approach to dealing with this data problem. Um, the, the fourth is intelligent memory, and then intelligent data movement accelerator, that's a mouthful, and then a non Neumann and graph store approach. I personally recommend that if you have interest in anything I'm just about, about to say, that you go out and find the people from those institutions and talk to them about it in more detail. I'm sure they'd be glad to share. Uh, a lot of the, the universities obviously have published in this area before, and so it's not a deep, dark secret. Uh, what I'm going to talk about Intel has actually already been published too. It's a paper that's being presented here, and uh, in 2023 there's another paper. It is, it is not the agile design, but it's the network that they're using in their agile design. So the first, the first is Georgia Tech. Um, I did these alphabetical, I think, or something like that. Um, this, I really like this approach. I mean, their, their basic idea is to intelligently move the compute to the data. Um, and, and it's based on, on a, a lot of work that was done at, at, at Georgia Tech and Notre Dame and, and other places. Um, there are several different approaches. 
But, but basically what, what they're doing is based on an, an actor model for the computation using um, active messages to, to change where the, the tasking is going to take place. In the case of, of, of uh, th migrating threads, you know, basically when, when, when a processor is operating and it hits the remote address that it doesn't have in its local memory, that, that whole task, including the register, gets moved to wherever that data is physically located. Uh, it's a very interesting idea. It also presents a lot of challenges, of course, because you could almost imagine this ping pong effort going around your system. And, and I'm not sure that by itself is the right way to do it, but, but, but as I said, it really poses some very interesting research. Uh, and I, I think the idea of the actor model is, is very intriguing. It's been around since uh, Hewitt published his paper in 73 or something like that. So it's, it, you know, a lot of these ideas that you see here have actually been around for a, a while. It's just a question of packaging them up in a different system, dealing with the software issues. But, but this, is, this is a very, very interesting uh, approach. The second is by AMD, Compute Everywhere. A uh, little different than, than the first one. In this particular case, uh, the basic idea is that the computing elements are all over the place. They're at the disk, they're at the non-volatile memory, they're at the network switch, they're at the, obviously at the node itself. Um, I can't really go into a lot of details on what their thoughts are, but, but it's compute everywhere. So now you, you're sitting there thinking, okay, so I have compute at my disk and I have compute someplace else where there's large DRAM memory. Am I programming to that? or am I programming it at a higher level? I, I think the productivity issue here is, is very significant, and, and I'm absolutely sure that AMD is gonna attack this, because otherwise it will be incredibly hard to use this. But it's a very interesting approach. Access data everywhere, access data everywhere by Intel is, is, is basically a, a, a incredibly efficient uh, network that is, delivers high bandwidth but also is very good on small packets. And the basic idea here is I can get to the data wherever it is, which is not to say you're always gonna move it either, but, but you have access to all the data. And, and they do that through the network, but also what they call Vegas, which is their virtual uh, extended global address space. And um, the, basically what it does is it, it allows you to migrate the data and the resources to whatever the application is seamlessly, so you, you don't have to deal with that. Uh, so you can see three different approaches to dealing with this, this data problem. All of it, of course, is focused on minimizing the movement of the data, even if it doesn't look like it. Um, this particular example here by Qualcomm is work based on a DARPA project that, that this group is funded by. Uh, and this is just a piece of their design. This is not the design. Uh, whereas the first three, you can imagine how the overall system design fits into that uh, work that I showed you. But in this particular case, what, what, what they're doing is they're, they're re-architecting the DIM so that instead of sending an address and getting back 64 bytes, which, which is wonderful if I'm doing a dense computation and I need all 64 bytes in a cache, that's wonderful. But if reading an address, I get 64 bytes back and I only want one word out of those 64 bytes, that's not a very efficient way to deal with this problem of data movement. And, and that's what this is all about. They've re-architected the DIMMs, the, 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 sorry, the DRAM is conventional DRAM. They're not designing new DRAMs. They're just exercising the DRAM in a different mechanism. Another important part to this is the memory controller, of course, it controls all this, but, but they've enabled a, a uh, modification to the cache so that the cache could load a traditional cache line as, as, as all computers do today, or, or you can, you can uh, enable a scratch pad approach. And their approach to the scratch pad is to basically uh, uh, tag the memory locations as non-evictable so that you bring it in and then it stays. So as a programmer, I, all I really have to do is identify those areas that are non-evictable. I don't have to actually write that into my code itself necessarily. And the third, the third change I have is, is this issue of um, identifying data as read-only. So I can read it in, use it, and, and not worry about it in terms of caching. 
the, the fifth approach from University of Chicago, um, it, it, it's, it's rather, at some level, very simplistic looking. You know, I, I, it, it's basically that, that little, little rectangle between the memory and the cache. And you go, well, yeah, that's not much. You, know, you expect some major change, you know, a complete overhaul of the system. Uh, that's not what they're doing here. They basically are putting an accelerator between the memory and the cache and, and either doing some pre-processing on the data or determining how it's going to be load. Uh, they also have, uh, it's, it's event-driven uh, situation and, and the, 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 the clocks to, to generate these, these threads, is, as you can see from the slide, you know, one cycle versus hundreds or thousands on a, on a more traditional computer. So that looks, you kind of go, well, do well, you're not doing anything other than changing processor memory. But, but, but the up-down accelerator has connection to other DRAMs, other CPUs, and other up-down accelerators. So there's a, there's a network here that is not exposed in these slides right here, um, but, but that will eventually be the magic that makes this really work at the system level. Um, and finally, there, there's a, an effort from Indiana uh, where they're, they're uh, looking at non-binomian architectures. Uh, and in this particular case, on the left side, is they have this what's called active memory architecture. And, and it's, it's, it's a non-binomian approach. In that little triangle that you can see right there, there's this merger of logic and memory. It's not, the memory is not separate from the logic and, and it's, they're merged together. They're doing incredibly lightweight operations. There is, I probably shouldn't say this, there's not a floating point unit in that triangle. Uh, it's very lightweight. Uh, it's an idea that's been around for a long time. Um, I think it was von Neumann, or was it Turing? I can't remember, they're all back there. This was before my time. Uh, looked at this approach. Uh, it's different, it's not the same, it's not the same, but it's a very, uh, very interesting idea. It's a radical departure from what we're doing today um, because you don't have your traditional ALUs sitting there. The second part, which I found to be really intriguing, and I'd like to see if they can actually make it work, is treating graphs as first-class citizens in, in the system. And so they want to have a storage unit so that when I store something, I store a graph. I can access a graph. I can access, I'm sure, a, a subgraph, or I could probably even get down to the nodes and vertices, but you're treating it as a first-class citizen. And, and that seems like a very intriguing idea. And of course, there's more to it than just putting uh, NVRAM sitting in there. There's some logic that you have to put out there. Uh, keep in mind that, as I said, the, the graphs are being constantly updated throughout the execution of, of your program. Okay, so the whole program was based on the assumption that we had to do co-design. As I said earlier, that was one of those things that we really learned from the exascale studies. Co-design was critical to this, to this effort. Um, <clears throat> so that sounds straightforward. We have four applications, three industry standard benchmarks. They're all supposed to drive the design effort. The problem, though, <clears throat> is, is I don't have hardware here. I can't just take it out and stick it someplace and run a code on it and see how it performs. I have a design. I have software that is supposed to be a hardware system. So we have approaches to do in the modeling and simulation. We're going to use SST. As I said, there's other approaches out there that can be used. But if I only focus on performance, time to solution, in many cases, I can beat it by throwing more hardware at it. Right? And, and doesn't always scale that well, but, but I throw more hardware on it. So I've lost efficiency. And, and the whole program is all about efficient, productive systems. Uh, so we're going to look at efficiency in, in the co-design process, I should say the performers are. And in this table on the bottom right-hand corner, I, I put uh, a couple of uh, analytical models that could be used to measure the efficiency. Uh, these came from a, a paper that Mark Hill wrote some number of years ago. And there's probably other ideas. I'm not, I'm not dictating anything 
here in terms of what has to be done. But we're going to take a look and determine whether or not the designs are efficient or not. And so the performers really have to take this into consideration. Right now, they're, they're in a panic mode because they finally woke up to what they agreed to. We had a kickoff meeting uh, a month ago, and the whole kickoff meeting was all about modeling and the, and the workflows. We didn't talk about their designs. I didn't have them talk about anything about their designs. I didn't care what their designs were. I, I, I read the proposals, you know. But, but needed to get across the emphasis that you're doing a modeling simulation of your design using co-design, and, and that's what you're going to be judged by. And, and I think some of them woke up to the fact that, well, gee, that's really hard. And, and you know, they, 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 they can think about using SST on a new memory you know, module or control or whatever you want. But this is on a full system. And I guarantee you it's non-trivial. They are going to end up doing models of their designs. Those models could, could be analytical in nature. They could be using something like SST completely. That's up to them. I'm not telling them how to do the models. I'm simply saying you got to do a model. My testing evaluation team is going to assess your model and independently determine whether or not you're doing the right thing. The other thing is productivity. <laughs> and if you know anything about the DARPA HPCS program, which there are a few people in this audience who suffered through it with me, the P in HPCS is productivity, it's not performance. There was a tremendous focus on making highly productive petascale computers. That was the whole intent behind the HPCS program. And a tremendous amount of effort went into uh, discussing what is productivity. And, and so when it came to this, I threw it all away. And basically I'm saying it's lines of code. Because at this point in this effort, there's really no way to assess development time productivity. But if I can match the performance of a 40,000 line code with a couple thousand lines in the modeling simulation environment, that is productivity. And that's the intent here, is to make this whole effort easier to use. And at this point in time, it's the only viable metric we have. Okay, so I think I already mentioned this, the, the, the four applications. Um, I didn't really focus on the benchmarks. These are uh, standard benchmarks that are available. They're, they're a lot simpler to analyze. There's been a tremendous number of papers written on the best way to do breadth-first search. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I thought it was a good starting point for the efforts. And as I said, the, the focus here is, is on streaming data. We want to do forensic analysis, uh, not, I'm, I'm sorry, we want to do predictive analysis, not forensic analysis. And the data is streaming in, it's changing everything, and you got to keep up with it. Okay, so uh, believe it or not, I'm probably going to run out of time, so I'm going to go through this a little quickly. This, this, this is, this is, uh, uh, showing you what the workflow one really looks like. Uh, the different queries that you can have are, are, are looking for the connections, ID new things that occur, and finding new relationships. Um, and if you take that, take that, this, this diagram here is showing you what the, what the um, task graph looks like for the whole application. Um, we're not explicitly saying you have to model the whole application, but you have to model all the kernels in the application and you put it all together and you get the performance of the, of the application. And so in this particular slide here, I'm showing you three of the, of the five kernels that compose the, the, the application. Um, and so those kernels all map into the target metric table for this particular application. So each kernel represents a row in this table. This table and three other tables, actually more than that, were released in the BAA uh, in, you know, a year ago almost. And uh, we're going to update it because at this point in time, um, we didn't have solid numbers for today. The performers are going to be able to come in and tell me what they think their design can do on the target metrics, they don't have to live to these numbers, but if they're grossly off, they're going to have to explain it to me because they all wrote proposals saying they could do it. So, but we're, we're going to let them reset the, the table a little bit. But there are, as I said, there's three other tables and there's another set for the, for the benchmark codes itself. 
Um, <clears throat> as I've said, uh, all of the modeling simulation is done in uh, what we call assist. Assist is really just a development version of SST and it will all be released as part of SST. It's not really a separate branch, but, but they are discovering things that need to change within SST to accommodate this issue of doing a high level model that they may not actually have in the current version. So I don't wanna mess that up. All the designs have to include a runtime system. I'm assuming the runtime system is required to run the hardware, but <clears throat> I would not be, want to be the person who has to develop the runtime system using uh, uh, the modeling simulation environment. So I presume they're gonna try to do it on a conventional platform. So that by itself is gonna be uh, kind of interesting. Um, we release these, these miles, these um, applications. Performers are, are free to rewrite them completely. Uh, to say anything different would be actually silly because, because that implementation they have there matches some architecture. Everybody's changing the architecture, the implementation should change also. So they're free to rewrite them completely. What they can't do is change the functionality. And so the, the test and evaluation team will carefully look to see what the performers are substituting to make sure it does the same thing. It's not so much that I think somebody's gonna cheat, it's really just to make sure it has the same functionality. Because at the end of the day, I have to stand up for my management and tell them that everything is credible. Um, performers can uh, develop their designs in whatever environment they want. I'm not gonna sit here and tell Intel how to design silicon, uh, but what they have to do is provide their design in a manner in which that it can actually be integrated into SST and FireSim. FireSim is really doing uh, RTL modeling. Um, so that, that, that's the gotcha here. Um, <clears throat> so there are some, there, there are some challenges here with, with this, of course. Uh, SST is not really designed to do a simulation of large scale applications. So we have to constrain the size of the application so it can be realistically modeled, but, but they have to come up with a model of their system that uses SST, so it doesn't all have to sit in SST, but it has to involve SST. And my T&E team has to be able to independently assess what's going on. So for example, they can't just say, well, I've got this black box over here, it's proprietary technology, so I'm not gonna give it to you, and this is how it performs. And the answer then is, we don't need this project anymore because my director, the person who determines whether this goes forward or not, says if there's not a test and evaluation process, there is no program. Actually, she said project, not program. Uh, so we, we have to deal with that. Um, obviously, we want the, the, the modeling simulation to complete in a reasonable amount of time. Reasonable time could be weeks, it doesn't have to be that day. Uh, but the way the program is structured, uh, <clears throat> they have to produce their first design, the first model of the design, around the 16th week of the first phase. Each phase is 18 weeks, 18 months, I'm sorry, months long. Uh, so obviously we have to be able to finish the execution of the model before the first phase of the program ends, otherwise I've got a serious problem. Uh, and the, the last thing that's a real challenge here is evaluating security. The, the VA was really quite clear. We're doing security. Security is not the kind of thing you add in after you've done the design. Security has to be integrated in from the very beginning. But there are no benchmarks for security, uh, none that I would want to put on these, on, on these teams. Most of the benchmarks associated with security are probably more focused on high-level software that sits on top of the hardware itself. We, we don't have that. Uh, we barely have any software sitting on top of it. I'm not funding the development of program environments. I'm funding the development of a runtime system which obviously impacts the program environments, but I'm not funding the development of the program environments. So there's no way to take a, an existing uh, security suite, test suite, and, and put it out here. So that's gonna be a challenge. So I guess in the end, what we asked for in, in, the, in the BAA was to reinvent computing, to, to, to do really what Jack was talking about this morning. He focused a lot on dense computations, MPI, that worked very, really well. It's time for a change, and that change is gonna be quite substantial to deal with the data movement problem across 
that is intended to be very sparse. So I'm looking for who fits in the question mark. Now, I've already found it six, six groups, and so you might say, well, obviously we know possibility selections here. But as I said, I want the agile efforts to be discussed in an open environment. I want to stimulate the thought processes for our community and not just keep it locked up. And, and, and all of the projects are very open to that discussion. Uh, the companies are a little bit more you know, cautious. Uh, they're not gonna expose proprietary ideas, uh, but they will discuss the challenges and issues that they found. The universities are, are great. They're, they're, they're willing to talk, because they gotta publish a paper, so obviously they can't keep it locked up. So. Uh, and I have 20 seconds and I am done. So thank you very much. And unfortunately, I don't have time for questions. <laughs> or fortunately, I'm not sure which it is. Thank you very much, Bill. Let's thank Bill one more time.